Now on Facebook Live and syndicated on RadioBuzz.com, this is Teresa Van Zeller. Hello and welcome to all. So glad to have you back. Always thank you for taking time out of your day to spend with us. Looking forward to your feedback because I want to give you what you want to see. Education, instruction, all around good time bringing you information so that you can have a better life, a better you. Uh, today, my special guest is Mr. John Serbone, who I am absolutely thrilled to have on today just because not only is he overly and incredibly qualified, he's just a heck of a lot of fun. He's a hypnotherapist instructor, uh, an incredible stage, well-known stage hypnotist, best-selling author of several books. John, you've received countless awards, even the NGH Order of the Braid. If I went and named everything, we wouldn't have time for the show. So I'd like to just bring you on and say, John, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Quite an honor. I am so thrilled. And you and I have talked so many times. And one of the things I love about you is that you are so down to earth um, and most importantly, fun. You're just fun to talk to. And I'd like to talk about the first time I met you because it was at an NGH convention and we all went to dinner, all the like hypno gurus and stuff. And afterwards, <laughs> sitting in the lobby, uh, I don't know. We were we had all just been talking to that point, and all of a sudden, this total stranger, somebody who was at the hotel, you got up, you had them in hypnosis in under a minute and a half flat, and they weren't even part of our group. You are are the king of speed inductions. Can you tell us about that? I was first trained many many moons ago on um, the you know I, I drove my dinosaur to the training and. Um, I was originally told it would take 15 minutes or a half hour to hypnotize somebody, and I was never happy with that. So I started to watch what some of the older guys were doing in the profession and started to see that it was possible to hypnotize people very quickly. But back in those days, many of those guys didn't want to share any secrets. So I developed my own way of hypnotizing people very, very quickly. Um, I call it Serbone Speed Trance Inductions, and to date, I've created 84 of them. I've been clocked as fast as one-fifth of a second, ice cold on a stranger. That's sitting up straight, my fingers in their face, and then shoulders, head, and knees forward, you know, folded up like a sandwich. <laughs> and um, I think all of us in this profession are at a place where it's time for us to take it forward. I've been able to hypnotize people very, very quickly uh, in emergency situations, for example. I had a show I was doing up at the Hilton Hotel in Manhattan on uh, 57th Street and 6th Avenue, and it was this very, at the time, very she-she party. They had chefs from all over the world. They had a giant pool table. And when the crew was carrying the pool table out, the pool table fell on somebody's foot. And I speed hypnotized him and stopped him from going into shock. He was hyperventilating. Okay. So it's also great for demonstrations. It's also great for live TV demonstrations because if they give you five minutes of a segment, you can't do a 25-minute induction, even, this, even though you might speak, uh, speak as quickly as I do. You know what I mean? Right, so, right. The bottom line is, is that you need to get in there and bang it and make it happen. I also use them in my stage shows for demonstrations at the beginning of the show. Also to keep people in my show that may be fighting it to try and get out for some reason. Once they're up there, they change their mind or they get nervous to keep them in the show and keep the show going. So there's literally a lot of reasons why you can do speed inductions. And when they're done properly, um, you can actually get them down to seconds or fractions of a second. If it took me a minute and a half back in that lobby on that, that day, that's because I was going slow, you know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> based upon somebody else's um, nervousness or situation or that kind of thing. But I've done groups where I've put out people like in a line, bang, 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 right through. I did a stage show with a colleague out in Chicago for a hypnosis conference out there. And there was a lady who had glasses on and we had to take the glasses off of her. And I said, put your hands out here. It is what, what? And even with all the what, what? It took me under three minutes to put out an entire group of people, even with all those interruptions from that lady. Right. So I can put out a group very, very quickly in a hurry. And I do find that to be something all hypnotists should be learning to do at some point. If you call yourself a hypnotist, you should be able to hypnotize people very quickly. That story I originally heard many, 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 many years ago that it takes all that time is really silly. It's not true. Right. So right. it's something I think that builds credibility uh, it builds sort of a, uh, an awe 
a mystique about what you're doing. And even in a noisy room, when the audience is hard to grab attention wise, I drop somebody in a split second. All of a sudden, what was that? You know, right, oh, he did right. it again. Oh, we'll be quiet now. The show can start. You know, there's many reasons why you can use that. Right. And even like in a clinical clinical setting, if you're working with somebody and find out at the last minute, I'm getting a little bit of echo, Chris, um, find out at the last minute that they have panic attacks. Well, the last thing you want to do is a slow progressive relaxation. And I was able to switch over and do an instant and be able to deal with it. Um, but in the meantime, it is so handy for so many situations. Let's talk about stage shows. And a lot of our viewers, most are not clinical hypnotherapists. They're people learning about hypnosis. Um, how do you use, uh, obviously it's handy in a, in a stage show setting, but a lot of people are afraid of stage shows. I think it's the best training you can get to hone your skills as a hypnotherapist, but a lot of people are afraid of stain shows and the silly things that they're made to do. Could you talk a little bit about that with, with your, sure. yeah, because there's some clinical, there's, there's regular stage hypnotists and then there are uh, hypnotherapists that do stage shows. And I think you kind of fall into the latter. Well, I do both. I mean, in yeah, order I know. To do anything well, my view is you should be doing a little bit of everything well. Right. So um, I've taken things from my stage shows and put those in my clinical sessions. I've taken things from my clinical sessions and put them in my stage shows. So one thing builds on the other and it becomes better on both ends. In a clinical setting, I use the speed inductions, for example, if a little kid comes in here. Oh, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Can mommy be hypnotized first? So I put mommy out in a split second and the child isn't afraid anymore. When it comes to the stage work, um, I'm always looking to take this down the road 10 steps. I'm looking to create a paradigm shift in everything we do to the next quantum level. Right. So consequently, we in this field, many of us get stuck. We learn something from somebody and we're kind of right wherever we are. And I'm looking to take this to the next level, no matter what it is. My stage shows a high impact, high energy. And at the beginning of my shows, if I have enough time to do it, and that's actually like another five minutes, you know what I mean? Right. Because sometimes these shows are really on a schedule. Some of these schools, they have clocks and people looking at the clock. We have to go to the next class, whatever it is. But um, Or events, you know, sometimes they're very much on a time schedule. But um, when I put out people at the beginning of my show really, really quickly, it really freaks out the audience. And it creates this, wow, what did he just do? What are we missing here? Then the only problem I have at the end of the show is getting out of the room because there's normally 15, right. 20, 30 people. Oh, could you just do that for me only? Well, if I put you out, I have to put out another 30 people. <laughs> right. I'm never going to get out of here. There was one school I did a show four years ago. It was a graduation lock-in. That's an event where you keep the kids all night uh, to keep them from pregnancy and booze and drugs and car accidents. And I was like Bruce Lee leaving there. There was literally like 90 kids besieging me, making a wall of kids. And I had to like drop and drop and drop and drop and drop. And it was like bang, bang, bang to get out of the building <laughs> because they wouldn't move out of my way. You know, I've had kids at the end of my show start to tear up my clothes. That's really cool if you see that in the movie and you're a rock star. It's really Night of the Living Dead when you're on the receiving end of that. <laughs> I zombie know. You, coming to get you, ripping your shirt off. So I've had to figure out ways to get out of that, and sometimes that helps too. But it's also great for demonstrations in public places uh, when you're doing stage work because, say, I'm in a restaurant, and in the summertime I have shirts that say the Trans Master. I have my website on the back. And I'll do something cool. Well, I'm not going to pull a rabbit out of a hat. I'm not traveling with a rabbit most right. of the time, you know? <laughs> so the bottom line is, what am I going to do? That's cool. So I can put somebody out and do a mini street show. It's a stage show done. They call it street hypnosis, but it's basically a mini stage show done in a very short period of time. So I can put somebody out in a couple of seconds and do entertainment stuff in a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes. They're milking cows that aren't there. They're stamping out <laughs> ants at a picnic that they're not there. They're swatting flies and mosquitoes. Uh, they're glued to the chair. They can't get up. Their hand is glued to their head. Then all of a sudden, it's like, can I have your card? I need to quit smoking. It's a way of opening the door. Right. So the performance end feeds into the clinical end. The stage stuff is feeding into the speed hypnosis stuff. It all is like a giant wheel. It's like having spokes on a wheel. It's like this spoke, that spoke, that spoke, this spoke, you know? And that's kind of how I look at my career. Published author, you know, speed hypnotist, stage hypnotist, clinical hypnotist, instructor, trainer. So, and it all you know, feeds like, like, into like, each other. It's like the mags on my car. It's like a, it's like a star, you know? That's my <laughs> career. You know, it's like five <laughs> points, you know? Oh, 
it, it's just, it, and it's just so exciting. And when you're doing stage shows, like, like I said, okay, A, I have two questions now. Why do some people go in so quickly? Some don't. Let's start with that. All right, because some people are afraid. Some people are nervous. I'm going to make them do something stupid. I was trained years and years ago by Orman McGill, who was called the Dean oh. of American Hypnotism. Yeah. And it was one of the finest, sweetest, most decent men I've ever met in my life. He's a role model for me in many ways. And he told right. me at one point years ago, he looked at me, he said, you're a future me. You're doing everything I was planning on doing, and you're taking it to a new place. And I was very touched right. and very honored by that. Right. It was like, you know, a big moment there for me. But with the stage work, people are afraid, people are nervous sometimes because they've heard outrageous stories. And there are occasionally a hypnotist who will go off the deep end and do something silly. But I would say the vast majority of my shows are super squeaky clean, family friendly. Um, once in a while, you know, somebody says to me, we're doing a bachelorette party. That might be a different show. Right. But, it's not, but it's never anything that I'm doing. It's, you know, just suggestions, you know. Right. Um, and it's always a good time. I don't embarrass people in my shows. I don't get them to tell me stupid things that are going to humiliate them in front of the audience. I treat everybody who comes to me in the same way I do a clinical session right. with compassion with love, with kindness. Um, and at the end of my shows, I do something a lot of other hypnotists don't do. And that has to do with giving them personal empowerment suggestions. Yes. I season yeah. it with a little bit of the ketchup of clinical hypnosis or the mustard of clinical hypnosis mm -hmm. or the pep salt and pepper is of clinical hypnosis to get these people to feel better. I tell them they've had a nine hour nap, a seven hour back and foot rub. They're on top of the world. I don't know anybody that doesn't want a nine hour nap and a seven hour back and foot rub. If somebody was at my front door when this is over and offered me that, I'd bring them right in. I mean, so it's inspiring these people to rise above the challenges in their lives. I quite often say the greater the challenge or adversity in your life, the more mighty you become, the more inspired, the more empowered you become. Right. And when I get finished with the shows, everybody's feeling happy. Everybody's excited. Everybody's had a great time. Um, I let the people know, even if it's late, they feel relaxed like they've had that nap, but it's time for bed and they sleep right through the night. And tomorrow morning is the best chapter of their life beginning. Right. So I'm very careful to handle them in just a certain way. And I treat them with the golden rule. I, I treat them the way I'd like to be treated myself. Right. right. And, and people don't realize how good hypnosis feels. Um, I did a stage show once and the person that was doing Elvis Presley uh, turned out, I didn't realize, was spastic. So I got him up and, well... We just sat him down quickly again, and I relaxed him down. I went on with the rest of the show. But afterwards, he just came up to me and said, oh, my God, I feel like I just ran around 10 blocks, and I could do 100 more. I said, oh, I'm so glad. And he said, no, no, you don't understand. I haven't felt this good in a long time. And he ended up just sitting there. Just hypnosis feels so good that the participants, and then to give them positive suggestions on top of it that they want, you're just doing good things. You're doing fabulous things. Uh, with that being said. I did a show. Let me just jump in for a second. Okay. I did a show some years back yonder. I don't know, seven or eight years ago uh, at a temple in Great Neck, Long Island. And it was a fundraising event to help kids with autism. And I said to the rabbi, you know, you may want to keep the autistic kids out of the show. I don't know about putting them in the show. And I turned around. And the next thing, there was another 10 chairs on the floor. So now I've got like 40 people I'm working with, <laughs> and it's like 10 of these kids. So I figured I'm not going to break their hearts and throw them out of the show. If they pop out or whatever it is, right. I'll send them back nicely. They were fantastic because in hypnosis, the symptoms that their parents struggle with every day that they're suffering from seem to go out the window in many cases. Right. Right. So I was five routines off the end of the show. It was a floor show, not a stage show. And... um this father walks in from work late and he st comes stamping up. I'm getting my daughter out of your show. So I, I stood there like Superman. I put my hands on my hips and he kind of deflected off my chest. And I said to him, no, I'll take her out of hypnosis. And I whispered in her ear. I said, on the count of three, I'm going to snap my fingers. You jump up, you give daddy a hug and a kiss. You feel fantastic and happy on top of the world. After the show, he walked up to me crying. And he said to me, I'm such an idiot. And I wasn't going to disagree with him after what he, <laughs> what he did with me personally, you know. But... Um, I said, well, why are you telling me this? Like, and he said to me, this is a whole different little girl. This is not the little girl. I can't get her shoes on in the morning. I can't get her to take a shower. I can't get her dressed in the morning. I can't get her to eat breakfast. This is a normal little girl. She has no, that her exact words, that she hasn't got those issues anymore. 
She's like every other kid in the neighborhood now. What did you do? And I said, I hypnotized her. Apparently, that simmers down the symptoms. So right. I see work with children in various circumstances in my clinical work because of the stuff that happened in my stage show. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so many. There's just only good comes from hypnosis. Yes. Um, but with that being said, what are some of the funnier incidences, skits, whatever, experiences that you've had, which I'm sure they are a mile long in your shows? That could be a long list just by itself. You should <laughs> I, I was doing a show one time for a university in um, Pennsylvania, and I was five skits off the end of the show. I was almost near the end of the show. And this one young man in hypnosis, and I could see his eyes. His eyes are rolling up into his head. Just gets up and walks off the stage. And I've, it's just a, this event was for a, um, a freshman recruitment thing. So there was like eight, seven or 8,000 people in this place. It was packed. And um, I said sleep. They all went out. And I ran off to the side of the stage. And let's just say politely that he was undoing part of his clothing and about to answer the call of nature. Let's put it that way. <laughs> be polite about it. And he appear, appeared to be right-handed. So I grabbed him by the left arm. I, Mama didn't raise no fool, as they say, right? <laughs> so I said, freeze. So what are you doing? He says, dude, I really got to go. His eyes are rolling into his head. I said, on the count of three, you're wide awake and running for the men's room, feeling fine, getting there just in time. <laughs> and he goes, running out. Now there's all these people in this giant audience, like two balconies, packed room. And I know I've got them right in the palm of my hand. So I picked up the mic and I stood there for a second, dramatic pause. He had to pee. And they went through. <laughs> so I've had moments like that in the show. You know? I've had moments in my shows where people do unexpected things. I was doing a show for uh, an entertainment person, very well known. And it was a very small show. There was three people in the show. And I said, you'll be flirting with the most attractive person in the room. So there was these two gentlemen and this beautiful woman. This woman was like cover of a magazine, beautiful. I mean, she was just like that, you know? And all of a sudden, I blinked. Literally, I just blinked. And the next thing, her ankles were wrapped around mine. She had me in a bear hug, and she was sticking her tongue in my ear. <laughs> and I was laughing so hard that I couldn't say stop. <laughs> of course. I wasn't entirely sure I wanted to stop immediately, you know, just, just to be honest about it, you know. But for a couple of seconds, I'm like, in my head, I was like Goofy from Mickey Mouse. You know, I was like, no, no, no. Like, I couldn't even get the words out. You know what I mean? So there's always some kind of crazy thing. I did a show one time. I was I was in Manhattan. I was sitting with a woman who was very famous from the soap operas who has since trained with me to be a hypnotist. And um, she's doing stage work of her own, uh, lives out in Las Vegas. And um, I'm on the way back from Manhattan. I get a phone call from California. What are you doing at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning tomorrow? I said, I don't know, getting sheet wrinkles on my face. What is anybody doing at 3 o'clock in the morning? And she said to me, this guy said to me, no, 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 you got to call this woman. Um, you got to cover this show up in Massachusetts. I said, Massachusetts? It's like, I'm mean, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I'm in rush hour here. Yeah, Massachusetts, 3 o'clock in the morning. So I got home here. I had 25 minutes to contact this woman, book a hotel room, and get pack up the car and get up there. Mm -hmm. And it's pouring rain, and there's traffic, and there's five yokels with a bobcat drilling I-95 in the rain. <laughs> and the traffic's backed up for miles. And I call up. I get a fax machine at the school, and I, it was a crazy thing. And I run in there, and the fire fire commissioner for the town and the police chief is standing there. That's a fire zone. You can't. I said, I'm a hypnotist. I'll get the keys, son. And it was like, you know, it's a wonderful life. It was crazy. <laughs> so I run into the room, and I said, where are my chairs? And I started to pre-talk. They said there'd be chairs. There was no chairs. And these kids grab the chairs. They put them up against their butt, and they walk sideways kind of up there and sit down in the chairs. So I come up with this new routine that a sheepdog is licking your face. And, you know, we all make that face, right? We kind of like it. We kind of don't like it. There's too much saliva. What the hell is going on? And um, all of a sudden, the three girls in the middle start French kissing the dog back. <laughs> and now there's tears running down my face. And I look out in the crowd. And, like, the whole town is there. The whole school is there, freshman year to, like, senior year. And, I mean, the place smelled like gym socks because they were all running around before I got there. But they were fooling around, rolling around on the floor laughing. I did a show in New Jersey one time. This kid... Um, who was running the DJ equipment was laughing so hard he fell out of the chair and slid down onto the table onto the floor from the show. I actually have a clip of that on my YouTube page. Nice. So I've had a lot of really weird and fun things happen in my shows, 
And it's always the thing you don't expect that is the funny thing. It's always something I've never seen before. Unplanned, unplanned, yeah. Yeah. Um, I told them that one time the room was getting, normally most hypnotists do hot and cold. The room's get too hot, the room's getting right. too cold. I had somebody grab me around the thighs one time and would not let go of me. And I'm standing there where they're squeezing the life out of my thighs. And again, I'm laughing so hard, I can't stop. <laughs> you know? Um, there's been a lot of different things like that. You know, some of the stuff is really out there. And I don't know how far I can go on this program or how, or how far I'd like Keep to go. Keep it decent. We're new. <laughs> yeah, but some of the stuff that comes out of people's mouths is not the way I was raised, you know? Yeah. So, you know, there are things that come out of people's mouths. And I'm always like, no foul language or, you know, behave yourself or whatever it is. But the easiest thing I could do is just say sleep and put them right back out again, which is probably right. the best thing. Unless, of course, there's a tongue in your ear, which, you know, is <laughs> Then you to take do. your time. <laughs> yes. But uh, there's been a lot of crazy stuff. And also, too, at the end of my shows, I tend to put in post-hypnotic stuff. I'll say stuck, and they're stuck to the floor. They're stuck to the chair. My funny red pen is hysterical. My watch is funny. My shoes are funny. And they can't get up. Even though they're lo no longer hypnotized, they're still responding as if they were hypnotized. So there's right. a lot of things you can push the envelope in a stage show with. And also right. at the end, sometimes I've had people come up to me and ask me to do, can you give me like two more minutes of suggestions about something in my life? Right. If it's an out-of-town show and I can't really work with them, or sometimes I'll do a session with them on Skype. With Skype, I've worked all over the world um, on every continent except Antarctica. I have books and sessions on every continent with Skype uh, except Antarctica. I've yet to crack that lucrative penguin market, you know? But, um, <laughs> you got to find it. <laughs> the reality is I've worked all over the world with this stuff. But again, you help where you can. You know, right. and, and jump in there where you can. And I've done a lot, you know, people have said to me things about, oh, I think that stuff with stage hypnosis is pushing the envelope. Well, you know, I've raised as much as over a quarter of a million dollars from one event where I was hired one night to help fight children's cancer. Right. You can't really contest that. You know what I mean? Right. And again, I work within a certain moral code. I'm a member of certain hypnosis organizations that have, uh, you know, ethics codes and stuff that I have to follow. So I'm very careful about following the ethics of what I do. Right. And, you know, it's interesting because it is an opportunity to educate. Um, I was doing a stage show um, for a convention and I was at the faculty meeting the night before because I was part of that. And so was the medical doctor. And, and he looked at my tag and he said, oh, you're Teresa Van Zeller, the one doing the stage show. And I said, yeah. And he says, well, we know that's a bunch of malarkey. And he turned around, and he walked away. And it's like, no pressure there. I go to do the show the next day. And this one medical doctor is the one that gets up there and does everything. I had to stop him from taking his shirt off before he threw it into the audience. And he never said anything after that. Neither did I. But a year later, walking through the NGH, I was I was just standing there talking um to a friend and here comes this doctor strolling around hadn't talked to him in a year and as he's what the last part of the skit i should add was he was the one throwing me his wallet every time he sat down he was going to bring me back his wallet when he heard the word hypnosis or whatever so a year later here he is walking down the hallway and without even looking or acknowledging me as he's walking by he just reached into his back pocket pulled his wallet out took my hand put it in there and just kept walking and i thought okay that's a classy man he since quit um, teaching interns to strictly teach at the medical schools about hypnosis specifically. So you never know who you're going to reach. You, know, you change somebody's life permanently. That's right. That's right. You know, it's funny you talk about taking the shirt off. I did a show one time down in Florida at a university, and I said to this young man, you're a fashion model. He had like this swimmer body, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I reached down to get a sip of water, and he took his T-shirt off and threw that into the audience. And they saw him going for his belt. They said, freeze. The pants must stay on. I said, the, key, the pants are glued to you. They're welded there. <laughs> That's Sit right. Your chest, please, out you go. That was a heck of a show, too. I, uh, it was part of my college fraternity got me in down there. I'm in a fraternity from college. I'm a life member. You know, once you're in, they never let you out again. Michael That's Corleone, right? right? That's so right. Um, this other guy was, he looked like a lineman in football. This guy was huge. Nice guy, Felipe. Not Felipe. I forget his name. Anyway. He was in the show, and um, I turned him into Miss America. And he, won <laughs> this, and he started crying. Like, you know, you've seen the women win that prize shaking. They're holding the flowers. <laughs> and they're shaking. So after the show was over, he said, I never did that. I had to get the video camera out and back it up. He's like, oh, my God. You know? <laughs> but it was funny. 
you know? Um, there was another guy I hypnotized in uh, Brooklyn at another thing with the fraternity. And he was head and shoulders over me. He had to be like 350 pounds, but a solid big guy. Right. So as I gave a lecture on, like, I can come to your school and do a fundraising event. Uh, 80 guys are walking out of the room. And he says, um, sir, because I'm alumni, he said, uh, could you demonstrate that on me? So now 80 guys walk back in the room. And I'm on a tile floor with sneakers, uh, Nikes, whatever I'm wearing. And he starts tipping over onto me dead weight. So I'm thinking, you know, Bugs Bunny, think quick rabbit going through my head. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, that children's game, white as a feather, right? I said, but I touch you with my pinky. I'll be able to push you right back into center and you're going to go right into the center. And with my pinky finger, which I couldn't do with my whole body, he went right back into the center. Nice. And I told him every time we mentioned the name of the fraternity until the stri- stroke of midnight, he would laugh hysterically. I forgot to say just me. I'm a little bit better <laughs> than that. This is a long time ago. So he was sitting there, you know, with his nice shirt and tie, you know, jacket, very nice. And I had to go home. So I went home and I understand that in the bar, they were saying, you know, uh, whatever his name was, you know, let's call him John, right? Which is not his name. You know, John, and it said the name of the fraternity. He'd break out laughing. By the end of the night, he was in his undershirt with a tie, jacket, and shirt tied around his head. And as soon as midnight came, it stopped. <laughs> so there's a lot of stuff you can do that's fun like that. Even covert hypnosis, which I have a technique for doing. Oh, yeah. I mean, explain, was, explain that because most people don't hear the word covert hypnosis. What does that mean? Sometimes you have to come in under the radar to get the work done. And sometimes it's a little fun to experiment with that in places where you need it to be. So sometimes I've been in a restaurant where they tell me I can't have a table in a certain section. And right. you look at the section and there's nobody going to be at these tables at this hour of the night. It's just right. some memo that came out and this is what they've been told to do. So I was with uh, the woman I talked about from Las Vegas that I trained and a colleague who now lives in Las Vegas and his daughter. And we were at this pizza place on St. Patrick's Day a couple of years ago. And I said I wanted to go upstairs. It used to be a church that converted into this nice brick oven pizza place. Oh, no, no. Our corporate clients go up. I, I said, well, who do I speak to? We'll give your name to that guy, but then the other guy down there brings you. I said, okay, next guy. I want to go upstairs. No, no, our corporate clients, this is St. Patrick's. Very. I said, that's great. Who brings you to the tables? That guy over there. I said, okay. He walks up, and I changed up a couple of words in the sentence, and without giving him any money, sure enough, we were sitting upstairs. Nice. So this woman says to me, how did you do that? I said, very effectively. We're sitting here, aren't we? And she said, no, no, no. How are we doing? How did you do that? I said, I'm the trance master, baby, you know? <laughs> I can tell you, but I have to shoot you. So but I don't I don't share that one as often because I'm afraid people might misuse it. And this is the reason I don't hang out in jewelry stores and you know places buying and selling gold, you know, and banks right. and stuff. That could get weird. But um, I've been able to get like a free soda in a restaurant if you just use the right couple of words. But the bottom line is, is that everybody's in hypnosis at least seven, count them seven times a day. You think okay. it's easy to learn how to do that? Seven, count them seven times a day. <laughs> The more intelligent, stressed out, or creative, the more hypnotizable a person right. is. So everybody in stress level situations, like this guy is running around seating people in a noisy restaurant, he's in hypnosis. Right. So right. I, I told him after we sat down, I gave him some beneficial stuff about your stress levels coming down. You really look relaxed now. And he was like, <laughs> yeah, I kind of do now. You know, so <laughs> I helped him out a little bit, too. That was my tip. Yeah, there's so many things just on a day to day level, just when you come in contact with somebody every day. You know, I I remember you have three effects on somebody that you come in contact with. No effect, no harm, no foul. A bad effect, okay, if you're that type of person, or a positive effect. And it's just that little thought process, that little comment, that little suggestion, that nuance that turns people's day around. And it butterflies. It goes out into the universe, comes back tenfold. That's my first induction. It's called the butterfly induction or Sabone yeah. butterfly induction since people decided to take my name off the induction I created on the <laughs> internet. But it's, you know, people see me now at hypnosis conventions. They walk past me and say, hey, how you doing? I'm like, oh, yeah. Take it easy. You know, please. Um, I remember my niece was three years old. She's now in college. But um, she used to walk over to me, Uncle John, could you hypnotize me? And I would put her out. Then it was like I'd bring her back up again. And she'd look at me and she'd say, now it's my turn. And little kids really observe everything very, very well. And all of a sudden, yeah. I'm starting to go out. I'm like, get out of here. Go away. <laughs> get out of here. It's like, you know, you know, you don't give a, a child, you know, uh, the keys to a car at that age. You certainly yeah, don't do Yeah, a little that. turkey. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know, now that she's in college, I haven't heard any requests to learn hypnosis yet. But it might come someday. We'll see what happens. <laughs> 
Um, I know that we're already, I knew this half hour was going to go quick, but I want to talk a little bit about your most recent book. Tell us about it. My most recent book, which I forgot to bring from the other room. It's okay. Uh, it's, it's called Power Hypnosis, The Future of Hypnotic Suggestion. And I've written two previous books. I'm working on a fourth book right now, which are hypnotic script books. It's how to do various sessions I've designed and created and generate maximum impact. For example, the first two books, one of the scripts is like to help a woman get pregnant who's having a hard time. Sometimes if a woman is nervous and her body is off, she right. can't get pregnant. Then she adopts a child, and then all of a sudden she's right pregnant away. and she's trying. I walked into a workshop one time at a colleague's office about 50 or 60 miles away from here, and she said to me, there were three women pregnant around here because of you. <laughs> I, went, I went Bill Clinton on her. I'm like, I do not know these women. I have not met these women. You know, whatever it was, I looked at myself, at least they're going to accuse me. I should have had five minutes of happiness. But anyway, that's a joke. But um, basically, I've designed all of this stuff. So it occurred to me somewhere back a few years ago that I should come up with the next generation of how to do some of this stuff because I was already doing next generation level work. So all of my practice, like I said in the beginning of this interview, is about quantum state raising of what we're doing to a new level. Right. And the third book is basically a redesign of how suggestions get delivered or work and get stuck in someone's mind to maximum benefit. For example, when I first got trained, I was told a person is a stage two or three or four or five or six subject. And that's not true either because nobody is static. You can train somebody who's not right. that deep a subject to become better in time. Right. I was told originally suggestions have to be phrased in the present tense. What about tomorrow and the next day? So beginning right now and for the rest of your life, you were smoke-free, cigarette-free, lighter, healthier, thinner, better, stress-free, rising above any challenges in your life, motivated, releasing past situations that bogged you down and are now free since your breakup to go on to create a better life for yourself. All the other sessions that we do, the top sessions that we do, at least for me, are smoking, weight, stress, a better night's sleep overcoming a breakup, education enhancement, uh, and um, other sessions that I've done so many of over the years. Various fears, for example, would be another one. So I've figured out new and better ways to plug suggestions together to make this stuff stick and work. Right. That's what the third book is entirely about. Many of the classes I teach at these hypnosis conferences, or if I do a class out of my home, it's all the same thing. It's always right. about taking this to a new level. So I'm doing faster inductions. I'm doing crazier things on stage shows. I'm doing higher impact private session work. Um, I'm teaching people to think for themselves. When I first got trained, there was a book that was a prevalent script book at the time. And there was a lot of typographical errors in it. You know, you were happy, relaxed, and clam. And every time I got to that word, clam, I would giggle like an idiot and have to hold it in, you know. <laughs> and finally, it occurred to me one day, I can write better than this. And I did. And that's how these books got out there. So I am... My third book is really a revamp of how this stuff gets done. There's even some covert suggestions in there. You know, you know what it was you thought you knew, so now you know better instead to know this, you know, and this kind of stuff. And it's like, what is he saying? But your subconscious <laughs> right. mind will grab that and retool it That's and right. make the component necessary for it to succeed. Right. Or break down the past. That's not exactly the, that entire suggestion. It's part of it. But I had that come to me in a dream and I wrote it down. I woke up from the dream and wrote it down and went back to sleep. And the next day I looked at that and I went, wow, that's pretty good, you know? Yeah. And a mutual friend of ours who's a psychiatrist read that and said, that's the best hypnotic suggestion I've ever read. Mm -hmm. So I'm making impact where I can. And I'm going to continue to do that as long as I'm able to breathe and walk and talk. And apparently talking is not a problem. We've been at this for over a half hour. And I'm still, I still got hours worth of stuff to say. So thank you. Uh, oh, I can't thank you enough. And, and I'm thinking we we're running over. John, I cannot thank you enough. Please tell me you'll come back on the show again because, like I said, we could have talked for five hours as we often come close. <laughs> That's true. But well, I will. Yes, absolutely. I will. And thank you for the invite. I'm honored to be back. Uh, we've got the technical issues figured out this time. You know, yes, we did. A couple of hours of work earlier. So that's a good thing. So, yeah, I'm ready to do this. Ready to rock and roll when you want. Thank you so much. And thank you to your producer, Frank. Thank you, my love. And to all of our listeners, I knew you would enjoy this show. I hope you did. Um, have a great week. Learn what you can to become a better life, a better you. Live with Teresa Van Zeller. See you next week. You've been watching The Teresa Van Zeller Show on Facebook Live and syndicated on RadioBuzz.com. 
Join us next week, same place, same time.